think we'll get started. It is um, about noon, so thank you so much for coming. This is going to be our last lunchtime lecture of the fall semester, so I'm glad you could join us. Yes, but they'll be starting up again in January, so don't worry. Um, oh, and my name is Sarah Riff. I'm the Outreach Coordinator and Undergrad Advisor for the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program. In the back, you probably noticed there's some coffee and there's hot water for tea and some snacks, which you're welcome to um, enjoy. And we do have a sign-in sheet in the corner there if you'd like to be added to our listserv, if you perhaps heard about this talk um, through one of our speakers or through the newspaper. I know it was in the Isthmus last week and apparently it was on the Cap Times online yesterday. So um, I know there will be some books for sale too, which you're welcome to um, you know, speak with the presenters about after the talk. But other than that, I'll just turn it over to Alberto to introduce our speakers. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Alberto Vargas. I'm the Associate Director of LASIS, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I'll introduce Norm, and then he'll introduce the other, the other two speakers. Uh, Norm um, is a dear uh, friend and friend of LASIS, too. Uh, he was the founder and uh, operators, operations coordinator, as he says, of WORP. Uh, radio station here in Madison, uh, listener supported radio, and I encourage all of you to support uh, WRT. Uh, uh, we're very glad that Norm is here to talk about somebody who was really important on the Latin American uh, social justice movement. I remember in the mid 1980s, I was working in uh, Washington, D.C there in the triangle between the World Bank and the IMF. And, then, and I, I saw a guy with a pancart just walking around in the, in the, side, in the sidewalk <laughs> protesting against uh, the debt crisis at that time in the, in the 1980s. And then later on, uh, I just learned that it was John, John Ross, and I was such a, a great uh, guy. and, and uh, great person and we received him a couple times here in Lassie's to give talks and now Norm is going to present a, a book about the legacy of John Ross. So thank you Norm and I, uh, let me uh, leave you with Norm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Lassie's uh, and also the Haven Center, the UW School of Journalism and the Department of Communication Studies. Uh, for welcoming us here. Uh, this book is a book that is uh, somewhat challenging to uh, departments of journalism and communication <laughs> studies, so it's, uh, it's nice to have, uh, to have their names on, on uh, today's event as well. Um, with me here, uh, my co-editor, Crystalyn Bell, who was a student at Madison College one of the times when John Ross came through town to give these lectures that are in this book, and so we'll hear about her experiences, and then also um, Bob McChesney, um, Dr. Robert McChesney, professor of uh, journalism at the University of Illinois, Champaign, longtime supporter of free and independent media. And it was um, to Bob that we first went, John Ross and I first went to Bob to talk about the idea of publishing this as a book. And uh, so Bob has been supportive of this project throughout and wrote the foreword. Uh, very fine forward in the front of the book that you'll hear about today as well. So, um, we'll each speak a little bit, and then we'll invite you to ask questions and so on afterwards. And please, please do um, join us in this conversation. We also have, uh, as mentioned, we do have copies of the book. It's just out today. Is the official book launch? December fifteenth is this is the premier event of uh, a book tour. We'll be at Rainbow Bookstore this evening, and then uh, from there I go to New York on Thursday, and then to uh, Mexico City, and then Seattle, and then San Francisco. Uh, John's uh, homes were New York, Mexico, and San Francisco over different parts of his life, and so it's appropriate that we'll have book events in all of those cities. Um, there a Spanish version also? Uh, the book is only in English right now. I've had a couple of people ask me about uh, a Spanish version, and I think that would have to be down the road a little ways. But, uh, <laughs> um, so 
as I note in the beginning, I first came to know John Ross through his coverage of the uh, Mexican presidential elections of 1988, uh, the, uh, the theft of the presidential elections from uh, its rightful candidate. And after that, for many, many years, we, uh, we corresponded. We were able to work together on various projects. Uh, we were together in Cancun for the WTO protests when the uh, Korean farmer took his life on the barricades in Cancun to protest the policies of the World Trade Organization. Uh, we were together in the um, uh, Republican National Convention protests in, in New York in 2004 when uh, George W. Bush was uh, anointed for another term. Uh, and we were, um, we were together in Mexico City for the 2006 presidential elections and protests following those as well. Uh, John often came to Madison. As, as Alberto noted, he spoke here several times over the years. Uh, he also spoke at Edgewood College and at MATC, now called Madison College. Um, and his last trip in 2010 to uh, uh, MATC, he delivered uh, some of these lectures to a group of students, and that was uh, kind of the inspiration for this project becoming a book. The book itself is divided into two major sections. The first is the lectures. The second is an extended article about um, independent media journalist Brad Will, who was killed in Oaxaca in October of 2006. And the, the article is John's investigation into the death of Brad Will. And so the, the vision here is kind of, first we talk about it in the lectures, and then we give an example of how it's done, both Brad Will as independent journalist, but also John's technique of going to the place where it happened and gathering the stories uh, to make up this article. The last bit of the book is, a, is some appendic appendices. Uh, Appendix B is a series of links and resources for independent journalists, which uh, I put together with the help of uh, another WRT intern and a uh, longtime uh, radio producer with Free Speech Radio News. And so that's uh, the part I think that's most um, sort of modern in the book. John was very much an old style reporter with a pencil and paper. And uh, so we take it up to the uh, 21st century in this last appendix with a series of uh, internet resources to, uh, to help young journalists. Um, also want to thank uh, Jillian Potter, a local um, indexer who put together the index for the book at the end. I, I have a strong prejudice that every book should have an index, and so I wanted to make sure this had one. Um, I was going to read just a tiny bit from the book, and just to give you a feel both for John's prose and also the topic that um, we're addressing here. The, um, the book started as lectures that were given at New College in San Francisco in the fall of 2006. John had a residency there, and uh, he delivered these lectures to a classroom of students over the course of several weeks. The print version has been somewhat uh, translated from the oral presentation to a, uh, a printed work, but mostly you'll hear John's voice in every line of the book. Okay, class, this seminar is called Rebel Journalism, just in case you wandered into the wrong room. What is rebel journalism anyway? Just some catchy scam to sucker in young and not so young media studies grad students at eccentric overpriced institutes of higher learning? Is rebel journalism journalism about rebellion? You bet your booty. That's the content of rebel journalism. Rebel journalism advocates rebellion. In fact, good rebel journalism incites rebellion. So who is a rebel journalist? Well, hang on. I don't know about this journalist stuff. It sounds snooty. I call myself a reporter. It's a lot closer to the street. But is a rebel reporter just one who covers rebellion? That seems to depend on which side of the barricade you wind up on. A good rebel reporter 
doesn't just take notes on rebellion. A good rebel reporter incites rebellion, makes people angry, encourages organization, offers them hope that another world is possible. A rebel reporter is a participant in rebellion or resistance or revolution or whatever you want to call the struggle for social change. Like the Zapatistas, our words are our weapons. And one last little bit here from later in the lectures, a whole section on the use and power of language. It's the Fourth World War, and our only weapons are our words. We need to keep our powder dry and our weapons clean and well-oiled. Our words should be well-chosen, that is, not just strung together from left to right, but considered both for their accuracy and their music. Our words should be ready to paint the picture. They should be in technicolor and notice the sky and the wildflowers. They should be hard and concrete and not mistelling details. The writing is on the wall. Our words should reach out and grab the reader by the throat or the eye or the heart. Our words should engage people. Most of all, our words should say what we want them to say. Language is alluring invites you up to her or his room and you fall into his or her arms and forget the point. Or maybe that is the point. Rebel reporters use rebel language, although not necessarily the language of rebellion, which is often frozen and formulaic and devoid of meaning. Rebel reporters are at war with cliches and the business as usual way of saying things. Rebel reporters don't make language into a business a commodity to be bought and sold by the metric ton to media mafias. Rebel reporters puke on the blandness of corporate journalism, the absence of passion. The words of John Ross. So I want to hand it off to uh, Crystalyn Bell, my co-editor. Um, and uh, as again, she was a student here at Madison College, later uh, came to volunteer and intern at WORT, also edited the student newspaper at uh, MATC when she was there, which uh, won her some awards. And then she moved to Latin America and uh, is now in graduate school uh, on the West Coast. Crystal and Bell. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start out by say saying how much this is an incredible honor for me uh, to be sitting here with two of my heroes. Um, Bob, for his incredible volume of work that he's produced, has contributed so much um, to this field, and then Norm for being just an amazing mentor for the past five years now. Um, I first met Norm and didn't realize it until a while later when John came to my classroom. And I was a non-traditional student at MADC, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was 23, I still don't really know what I want to do, but I'm a little more comfortable in that role now. Um, and so here I was, and taking this certificate in journalism, trying to figure out like my way in the world and what like what mattered to me and what sort of uh, contribution I wanted to leave as sort of my life's work. And I, you know, all my teachers kept saying this thing about objectivity, and that was like the journalism creed. And so here comes John Ross, like hobbling into my classroom with like a cane, his eyes like off to the side from like a fight that he was in with the police in San Francisco, and and I already know like oh, this is going to be good, you know. Um, so he came in there and basically was, <laughs> much to my teacher's dismay, I'm sure, it was like, objectivity is a lie. The very fact that you are sitting in this classroom right now is a problem because you are not out there in the field. Um, so that's what the section I wanted to uh, write or read about in the book, sort of this impression that he left on me in the beginning. And then I'll close with a poem that he ended up closing with in the classroom. Um, so you have to imagine me as a 70 something year old man with like a, um, a magnifying glass about this big. He's like reading this poem in my class. <laughs> so this is my advice. Avoid J school like a poison. Sorry, sorry Bob. <laughs> Rebel reporters practice investigative reporting. They investigate who is getting screwed, who is doing the screwing, and who and how those who are getting screwed can reverse this equation. Rebel reporters are always finding flashlights. Finding flashlights, of Ed's, as Ed Sanders describes in his remarkable City Lights volume, Investigative Poetry. 
flashlights to peer into the darkness. It is our officio, our job. Rebel reporters practice advocacy journalism. That is, we stand for something, that is, we stand for something. J School teaches you the opposite. Rebel reporters practice participa participatory journalism. They not only stand behind their stories, but stand inside of them. Rebel reporters become their stories. For the J schoolers, the highest ethical principle is so-called objectivity. Rebel reporters say that objectivity is an instrument of class oppression that gives greater voice to the oppressor than the oppressed. Rebel reporters don't arrive at the gates of Dachau and in a taxi and ask to interview the commandant just to get his side of the story. Sure, rebel reporters need to know what the oppressor is saying to dissect it and rip it apart, but we don't really have all that much time to listen to their lies. And so here's the, the poem. The midnight special burrows into the bowels of the North American nightmare. Like a sleek silver tapeworm consuming the body fat of the most overstuffed nation in the known universe. The rules for travel are posted at the terminals. Do not leave luggage unattended. Report all suspicious activity. Protect your back at all times from homegrown suicide bombers, homeland security, GMO corn, AIDS, the Antichrist, the New York Times. I scratch out a map in a wilderness of white paper that bloodies the nation with crimson headlines from sea to stinking sea. I can no longer parse the horror. The scales have fallen from my snake eyes. There is no lie worth dying for. Ir al lugar de los hechos. Go to the place where it happens. This is the first rule of the finding. They will not want you there, but you will learn much from their fury. Write it all down, write away in your head. Do not let the details leak out, no matter how badly they beat you. Do not forget their faces. Do not forget their eyes. Do not believe everything they say. Do not believe anything you read. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here and be asked to participate in this project. Uh, you've already got a reason for why I wanted to be involved. This guy can really write. <laughs> I reread the book in the last couple of days, uh, and it was just a pleasure, just like the first time I read it. Uh, you just look at the picture of this guy in the cover. He, he jumps off the page. This guy has so much wit and charm and personality and spunk, uh, enough for a whole village and one human. It's extraordinary. Uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit of why I'm here, is you know why where he fits into journalism, which he clearly has a low regard for the stated profession. Uh, and, you know, one of the ironies of uh, rebel reporting, as he calls it, is that it's usually detested by professional journalists and accomplished journalists while they're active during their lifetime. But then once the rebel journalist dies and the issue goes into the history books, they get recognized for being right all along. <laughs> and uh, one person John Ross invokes in, in one of his lectures, uh, loudly and appropriately, is I.F. Stone who's probably the classic example of this. Today at Harvard, if you were to go to the Kennedy School, there's an I.F. Stone Award for Journalism, uh, for the best journalist of the year. I'm a judge on another I.F. Stone uh, Journalism Award at Ithaca College. Uh, and uh, he is uh, a hallowed name. 60 Minutes has done programs, uh, stories on him. He's one of the great names of journalism. What's forgotten about I.F. Stone is that for the pretty much his entire career after he left the daily newspaper PM in the 1940s, he couldn't get a job in mainstream news media. The Washington Post, the New York Times had nothing to do with I.S. Stone. Uh, and he couldn't get a job on the broadcast networks for his entire career. He basically managed his own weekly newspaper, I.S. Stone's Weekly, self-published out of Washington. Yet I.S. Stone, like John Ross, uh, like numerous others who I might have time to mention, broke a number of stories throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s that no other reporters were getting. Routinely broke stories no other reporters were getting. Uh, and he did it with very little resources. He didn't have a pool of people he could assign to go look stuff up. Uh, he did it basically because he ignored the conventions of professional journalism entirely. 
and it gave him an opportunity to see the truth that was being obscured by the official lies that everyone in power agreed upon, like the Korean War, like the Vietnam War, uh, and on and on in the great stories of our times. And I think that the question is asked, is there, you know, why was I of Stone, why are John Ross so clearly outside the mainstream? Why has journalism been so hostile to journalists of this caliber during their lifetimes? And John Ross was a stated opponent of J school journalism, of professional journalism, but it wasn't really professional journalism per se that was the source of the problem. It's really professional journalism per quo. And let me explain what I mean by that. We didn't have professional journalism at all anywhere in the world, let alone the United States, until the 20th century. All journalism was highly partisan before the 20th century. You knew the owner of the paper, you knew the politics of the paper, because the owner was usually the editor. In 1892, if you read an American daily newspaper and it was a Democratic paper, there's a good chance it wouldn't even remember, mention the Republican candidate for president at all. It'd be like sort of watching Fox News. Uh, and vice versa. You knew it was stridently partisan, and you knew it all along. And the system worked well. So pretty much, because there were countless newspapers. A city like Chicago had 15 or 20 daily newspapers. None had more than 5% of the market or 10%. And if you wanted to start a new newspaper, it was pretty easy to start one. There were countless foreign language, labor papers. It was a pretty vibrant marketplace of ideas. By the early 20th century, that um, capitalist economics and the rise of advertising, so the main form of support, pretty much winnowed down the market and made it highly monopolistic, except in the very largest cities, and became impossible to start a new newspaper. And that created a great crisis in journalism. Partisan journalism, when you only have one or two newspapers and they're stridently partisan and you can't start a third, smelled like month-old fish out on our table because it was basically the, the viewpoints of the owning class. And it produced a great crisis that led to the emergence of professional journalism in the United States between 1900 and 1920 or 1925. And there was this period where newspaper owners wanted to come up with a type of journalism that could justify their monopoly control over the institution and not challenge it, not say that's a problem. Instead, they said, we will informally cede control of journalism to the editors and reporters. They're responsible for it. We'll just run the business side of things and make the money. And that was the birth of professional journalism. It was done, it's not a very uh, noble birth, but that was its birth. That doesn't explain what type of professional journalism you're gonna get. That doesn't tell you what story gets covered, what doesn't get covered, what goes on the front page, what goes on page 10, and what doesn't get any coverage at all. Those were still powerful ethical and moral questions that had to be answered. And we had a great fight in America in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s to determine what professional journalism would be. And as fate would have, I.F. Stone was involved in that fight as a very young journalist involved with the newspaper guild, the journalist uh, union that was formed in, in the 1930s, along with George Seldes and Haywood Brune. Uh, the newspaper guild, which organized all the great newsrooms of America into the union, was trying to define professional journalism uh, in one way. Uh, and they battled hard to say professional journalism should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Professional journalism should see its job to do basically what John Ross said. It should represent everyone outside of power versus everyone inside of power. It should not be partisan. It shouldn't take sides. It should treat everyone with the, with the exact same standard. It shouldn't play favorites. But its mission is to advance the interests of those outside of power. That's what professional journalism ought to do. That's what makes it nonpartisan. And people like I mentioned, Stone, Seldes, were great champions of this. Um, I won't keep you in suspense. That vision didn't win. <laughs> uh, but it had a, long, a better fight than you realize. That history has been lost for the most part. Uh, it was only in the 1940s and 1950s that the type of professional journalism that we ended up with, that John Ross opposes, became sacrosanct, and ingrained in the United States, and ingrained in J schools. And that's the idea, the job of professional journalism is to accurately report what people in power say. People in power are debating an issue, you can report that debate as a legitimate debate. If people in power agree on something, you can't challenge it, because that would be injecting yourself, your own opinion, your bias, your ideology. So that's why mainstream journalism misses every great story, because all the great stories are when everyone in power agrees on it. You know, like Vietnam attacked us. Yeah, I guess we have to go after Vietnam now. I have some say that's nonsense. Where's the evidence? I don't care if someone in power told me that. I want to see better evidence than that. So he went after a story no one at the New York Times looked at, or the Washington Post, or NBC, or CBS. And that was the great problem of the type of professional journalism we got. It, was, it made its bed with the status quo. It did not want to offend people in power, and it didn't offend people in power. Now, it occasionally, at times, produced great work, especially in the 1970s. And there were strong social movements that gave space for journalists. Uh, when the profits were very high, the unions were strong, so it created some resources for journalism. 
but it was always an informal power. You know, it was never had actual control over the room. It was never uh, locked in. And we've seen much of the greatness of professional journalism lost in the last four decades as journalism has withered and now is in the process of fully disintegrating. It's in its death throes right now as we speak, the notion of uh, commercially supported journalism. So in that battle, uh, Eye of Stone, like John Ross, uh, they move to the outside. They become the dissidents, the rebels, the people who can't get a job in a J school, who are ridiculed as not being serious reporters. But they're the ones who are always there, right? And you only find out about it after their death, and then, then become lionized. Uh, and I think, you know, my challenge as a journalism professor, as a scholar, is to try to keep alerting people to the nature of this. So the people today who are doing this sort of work were routinely uh, criticized for no reason. And I think we know many of their names, Glenn Greenwald, Jeremy Scahill. Uh, there's lots of them. I, I hate to even start listing them for fear. I'll leave some very brilliant reporters and, uh, off. But you get the drift. People who basically hold Democrats and Republicans at the exact same standard. They don't care. They just want the truth to get out there. And they all see their mission as representing those outside of power versus those inside. Those are John Ross's rebel reporters. And those are the reporters uh, that this country uh, needs, and any country needs, if it's going to have credible self-government. I'll close on one point that's not in the book, and nor in my forward, I don't think, which is that when uh, the U.S. was created and the Constitution was written, there was a great debate about what role the freedom of the press would be. Uh, and the two people who were most concerned with this issue uh, were James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who were deeply flawed people. I'm not here to lionize either of them. But on this particular issue, they were extraordinarily prescient. And uh, uh, Jefferson was in Paris as the ambassador to France, a benefactor in 1787 when the Constitution was being written. So it was Madison who basically was sort of on the home front. And they were corresponding about freedom of the press and its importance. And then they didn't put it in until the Bill of Rights. But the first great issue that came up uh, was what to charge newspapers to be mailed. And in the, until the middle of the 19th century, all newspapers were distributed by the post office, basically be nationalized post newspaper delivery. In a major city like New York or Boston, there was postal delivery three times a day, seven days a week. So no newspaper, there was no paper boys, there were no newsstands, it was all post office. They were got a nationalized distribution system. And for weekly newspapers, that remains true to the present day. Uh, but for dailies, for most dailies throughout the 19th century, and the first great issue, the Constitution called for the uh, uh, government to establish a national post office. In the post office, 90% of its weighted traffic was newspapers. 50, uh, 67% of its uh, uh, units were newspapers. So it was basically <coughs> distributing newspapers is what the post office did. And the first great debate was, what are we going to charge newspapers for mailing? What would be the rate that we charge newspapers? And they understood the gravity of the situation. The more you charge, the fewer newspapers you're going to have. Because that was going to be a very high business expense. Interestingly enough, at that time, no one recommended that we charge full freight. No one said, well, let's charge them you know, free market, have <coughs> you've got to pay your way, there's no free lunch. No one said, make them pay full value. The range of debate extended from those uh, who argued it should be very heavily subsidized. One penny to mail a newspaper as opposed to, at that time, 24 cents to send a letter. So, even though it was much bigger. To those who said, like James Madison from the floor of the House, there should be no charge whatsoever. And Madison said, any form, any charge for distribution newspapers would be a form of censorship. He's, this is what, what I'm getting to when I relate to this book. Uh, it's imperative, he said, that we not charge anything for newspapers to be mailed because the first newspaper that would go out of business with any charge for mail would be the most marginal ones, the most dissonant ones. And the one thing we know from history is the truth always comes from the margins, it never comes from the center. Those are the voices of free society must always call the bait. And those are the voices that are always the first ones to get brought. And I think John Ross is a testament to that. Thank you. So the book, Rebel Reporting, uh, again today is its official book launch, December 15th. And uh, I'm going to be uh, in several different cities with it. Um, uh, Bob and Crystal and I are going to be at uh, Rainbow Bookstore tonight. Um, please, uh, please tell your friends. And uh, we do have copies. We're also uh, happy to open a conversation now. Um, I will say one other thing, not about the book, but about uh, my own work in radio, 
is that the reason that I have been involved for so many years in community radio is because community radio is a place where those marginalized voices are given space to speak out. And, and Bob, of course, has been a wonderful supporter of WRT here in Madison for years. Crystal and has volunteered there as well. And um, uh, a program of particular interest to this audience is our third world.